It's 28 September 2010, Princeton, New Jersey. We're in the Princeton University. I'm with Professor Bernard Lewis, and he's sitting right across from me. And the, the purpose is an interview with him on behalf of the Turkish Academy of Sciences. Professor Lewis, this is really an honor to be with you here. The honor is mine. Princeton, Princeton University to be interviewing you. Uh, on behalf of the Turkish Academy of Sciences. You are an important personality and we know that you started, your, your interest started in um, foreign languages and foreign history when you were made to learn apart from scriptures at your bar mitzvah. Yes. And so you started to, you, you wanted to know what the meaning was. Yes. Well, there were two things which led in the same direction. One was the point that you mentioned. You know, at, as part of my normal education, I was doing two languages, mm -hmm. French and Latin. So learning languages was not as strange and unusual then and there as it would be here and now. But um, learning a, a non-European language was something different. Mm -hmm. Now, in order to do my bar mitzvah, which is a sort of ritual ceremony at the age of 13, I had to recite a few lines of the Hebrew Bible in Hebrew. Mm -hmm. I wasn't required to learn Hebrew, just enough to know the letters mm -hmm. and read my few lines. But for a person of my temperament, that was an irresistible challenge. So I decided to everybody's astonishment that I wanted to learn Hebrew. What was it that I was saying? Huh? What was it that I was saying? in a strange language. Yes, yes. What was the meaning of what? I don't remember. Okay. Unfortunately, I don't remember what the portion was. Yeah. It was a long time ago that I was 13. Oh. But anyway, I do remember the excitement mm -hmm. of learning a new language and a new script. Mm -hmm. And um, I started off with Hebrew and that led in other directions. Mm -hmm. um, my parents hired a Hebrew teacher to uh, teach me enough Hebrew to do these mm -hmm. things. The assumption was that they would prepare me did, for my... Did your parents speak Hebrew? No. no they no, didn't. No, no. <laughs> Neither of them. The assumption was that they would prepare me for my bar mitzvah, and that when I had completed my bar mitzvah, that would be the end of it. Yes. Of now, to my parents' utter astonishment, when the bar mitzvah was over, I said I wanted to continue with my Hebrew teacher. Mm. And uh, as you can imagine, they were more than a little startled at this, but they agreed. And it was a piece of good fortune that my Hebrew teacher, the one that they had hired to prepare me, he was a, a genuine scholar. He was not just a, a, an ordinary teacher, elementary teacher. It just so happened that he was a real scholar. And he was able to respond to my interests and my questions and my enthusiasm. About history? About the language, the culture, the history and so uh -huh. forth. So that led off one thing after another. And I continued with the same Hebrew teacher, not only after past my 13th birthday, but right up to my 18th birthday. Oh, wow. uh, to the utter astonishment, as I said, of my parents and everybody else. Um, and then, you know, Hebrew led to Aramaic, and Aramaic led to Arabic, and so on and so on. What was your parents expecting you to become? A lawyer. A lawyer. Uh -huh. And so you became a historian instead? Yes. <laughs> well, I'll come back to that if you're... Okay. Okay. Now, the other thing that happened is, in English schools at that time, mm -hmm. history was an important part of the syllabus. Mm -hmm. uh, we had to learn history, and devoted a lot of time to history. And history, of course, in English schools meant primarily English history. <laughs> oh, yeah. Same, same here in Turkey. Exactly. English history followed by European history, and a certain amount of ancient history. Ancient history meaning Greek and Roman. Oh, yeah. Our ancient history, mm -hmm. so to speak. Now, I was fascinated by the history. I was always interested in history. And in both the English history and the other history, I developed at a very early age, I developed a desire to see things from the other side. Mm -hmm. Now, for example, as you probably know, the history of England uh, for a long time consists mainly of wars with France. Oh, France, yes. 
So I thought, well, what did the French say about this? Yes, exactly. <laughs> well, I looked around and didn't find anything. I asked my father, he said, well, he would try and find something for me. He managed to find me a history of France mm -hmm. in English translation. The French history of France in English translation. But you were already learning French. Yeah, but not well you? enough to read a history. Mm, I see. That came later. But I got a history of France in French. I was able to see the Anglo-French wars mm -hmm. from the French point of view. Then there were two things which brought me back into the Middle East. Oh. One was the Crusades. Ah, yes. And the second was the Eastern Question. Oh, yes. Both of which were an important part mm -hmm. of the history syllabus. So learning the Crusades, I thought, well, you know, that's one side we're getting. One side, how does it look from the other side? <laughs> <laughs> and, the uh, same sort of curiosity. Curiosity, yes. And when we got to the Eastern Question, which is a little later, <clears throat> we were supposed to do that according to the, to the diplomatic documents. And I remember my special subject at university was the Eastern Question, the crisis leading to 1878. Mm -hmm. And this was part of the history syllabus, and the history had to be studied in the original documents. Mm -hmm. And the original documents were British documents, French documents, German documents, Austrian documents, Russian documents. And I said, what about Turkish documents? Mm -hmm. And they said, oh, there aren't any Turkish documents. Which was true. There were none in print, none available at that time. What what, what year was this, sir? This would have been round about 1934, 35. Yes, exactly. So mm -hmm. there were the archives were, yes. were were closed. At the that archives time. were closed, and uh, nothing was available in print. Mm -hmm. So I thought, well, uh, there are so many British, French, German, Austrian, Russian. Everybody else has documents. There must be Turkish documents. They said there aren't any. You don't have to bother about them. But I did bother about them. <laughs> I just wanted to have that additional dimension to the historical process. So you see, coming on one side from the Crusades, on the other side, the, uh, the, Eastern, question. the Eastern Question, both led me into the Middle East mm -hmm. uh, with a need to learn something about Middle Eastern languages, to learn something about Middle Eastern history. That was one way in which, one, one path which led me in that direction. The other was that at the time of my bar mitzvah, I had a number of presents. Mm -hmm. This is usual, you get presents in your bar mitzvah. One of which was an outline of Jewish history. Mm -hmm. In English, of course. <laughs> yeah. Now, this outline of Jewish history took me into all sorts of previously unknown places. Mm -hmm. Because it wasn't limited to England or Europe. It took me to Moorish Spain mm -hmm. and to Ottoman Istanbul and to Abbas in Baghdad, and so on, and so on, and so on. And this absolutely fascinated me. And again, I said, I want to know more about these things. So, when the time came to for me to go to university, that's to say when I was 17, 18, and the family had decided that I was going to be a lawyer. Now, the practice in England at that time probably still is, that if you want to be a barrister, you go to university, you get an education in whatever you're interested in, and after that you make arrangements to study the law. Mm -hmm. You can even start studying the law while you're still a student, but you don't have to. Well, I did. So, I, by that time I got very interested in Middle Eastern things, so I decided that I wanted to take my degree in Middle Eastern history. Mm -hmm. So there was fortunately a history syllabus in the University of London, mm. which you could do what we, what was called honours history. What you were studying law at one side, and then and as a side issue, you yes. started learning That's history. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, the law was sort of intermittent. Mm -hmm. I wasn't doing the law systematically, mm. but I was attending some courses and reading some books. But my main study was on history for, for my degree. So I went to the university to take a degree in history. And the syllabus was that I had to do European history, Middle Eastern history, and at least one Middle Eastern language, and I took Arabic. Mm -hmm. Was that possible at that time at yes, the yes, in, yes. in the university? Yes, it was mm -hmm. possible. And um, I had to do a special subject, 
you know, special subject is one which is studied in the original documents. Mm -hmm. And for that I chose the Eastern question. I see. Which is what led me to the question of where are the Turkish documents, why aren't there any Turkish documents, and so on and so on. Um, now, the idea was that when I finished my BA degree, I would devote myself to the study of the law. Mm -hmm. uh, fortunately, or unfortunately, depending how you look at it, uh, something happened. When I got my BA degree, mm -hmm. I came out first to that year. Mm -hmm. uh, in all the history students, there were more than a hundred graduates in various kinds of history, and I was number one. Oh. Now that carried with it a prize mm -hmm. of 100 pounds. Fine. Now, in 1936, supposed to be a lot of when money. I got my BA, 100 pounds was quite a lot of money. Yes. And uh, we were all naturally delighted and excited and so on. There was, however, a problem. There was a condition attached to it. Oh. And what was the condition? The condition was that you had to continue with graduate studies. Oh, I see. So you had to abandon law? No, I didn't have to abandon it. But I had to register for graduate studies in history in in this or another university and proceed towards a master's degree or a doctorate. So that was not a problem. It just meant some delay. So I I registered for an MA in Middle Eastern history, hmm. and um, went at some point to France. My Professor, uh, the late Sir Hamilton Gibb, mm -hmm. when I told him what subject I wanted to do, he said, well, you better go to Paris for that. I'm not good at that. You should go and work in Paris. They're better at it. So I spent the academic year, 1936-1937, as a graduate student in the University of Paris. Oh. There I met a truly remarkable man who was one of the formative influences in my life. I don't know if you know his name. Adnan Adavar. Oh yes, definitely. Yes. He, he, he was a famous. scholar. Yes. Well, he was a, he yeah. was a scholar. He was a, sci a historian of science. Yes. That was his main field of scholarship. He was a, a truly wonderful man, a, mm -hmm. a great teacher, an inspiring teacher. And also his wife, Hello, was an indeed. important personality. Yes. The anyway, it was in Paris that I met at the mm -hmm. and I was his student mm -hmm. for one year in Paris mm -hmm. and he was certainly again one of the formative influences in my life. Mm -hmm. um, from him I first learned Turkish mm -hmm. and I first learned to have, how shall I put it, to have a feeling for Turkish. Yes. And uh, we got on very well, we understood each other very well. So he, he also taught you the Turkish language. Yes, as well he taught as me Turkish the, history, whatever. Oh yes, he taught me the Turkish mm -hmm. language. Mm -hmm. uh, that was primarily what he was supposed to teach. He taught me mm -hmm. Turkish language. That was where I started learning the Turkish language. You know what his name means? Adıvar. Yeah, but you know why he took that. Yes, name? it's the one who has a name. And when he and his wife they went into exile, yeah. they had a disagreement with other Turk. Mm -hmm. So that when in Turkey, the law was passed requiring to people to take a name, a surname. They didn't take one, they didn't need one. Oh. And then at some point they they decided to return to Turkey. Mm -hmm. And they made their, they settled their disagreements and they returned to Turkey. They had previously been living in France, I think. They decided to return to Turkey and the Turkish authorities informed them they said, you have to adopt a surname. Mm -hmm. And uh, he thought about it and he said, All right, my name is Adava. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> he has a name. <laughs> he has a name. Adova, yes. Anyway, Anna Adovar, as I said, was one of the formative influences in my oh, life. I see. He, he taught me Turkish and he made a very good job of teaching mm -hmm. Turkish. This and, is uh, very interesting hearing it from you, sir. Yeah. Well, I was there for a year, an academic year, that is. Have you and been able to learn Turkish in that year? Well, I'm not all the way, but I mean, during you started. the first year. Mm -hmm. I, mean, we, I did it very intensively, mm -hmm. and uh, he, he, he was a superb teacher, mm -hmm. and I really did make good progress, and uh, by the end of my first academic year in Turkey, 
I was able to read some texts. Oh, good. And then I continued on my own. Now, since I was also doing Arabic and Persian, mm -hmm. switching from modern Turkish to Ottoman Turkish wasn't all that difficult. Wasn't really. Because I knew the script yes. and the large part of the vocabulary. Of course, you learned the, the, the older scripts, exactly. the Arabic yes. letters. Etc. I learned that when I learned Arabic. But how, how did you manage? You said that you went into the Turkish archives in 1949. Yes. And then you were able to, to decipher them, to understand them. And even Turkish historians find it very, very difficult to understand the... Well, there are two questions. The, the, the language is yes. so different. There are two questions. One is the language, the other is the script. Yes. Now, the language was not a problem. Mm -hmm. I had been doing Arabic and Persian as well as Turkish. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had been reading Ottoman texts. Mm -hmm. I mean, printed Ottoman texts, so that I knew the language fairly well. And uh, un reading and understanding a document was, was not a great problem. Reading the scripts was more difficult. Mm -hmm. And there were various kinds of scripts. They used different scripts for different purposes. Yes. And, some and, of the, and the wording, I hear, sir, was very, very, very different from what we do today. Because oh, yes, I mean, they say all sorts of things and then, you know, there's just one line where the purpose is cited. Yes, yes. And you have yes, to be, yes. you know, there. It's a technical language, but it's not too difficult to learn if you know Arabic and Persian. Mm -hmm. um, the real difficulty was deciphering the script. Mm -hmm. And then I had to struggle with it. And there, I must say, the archivists were very helpful. Mm -hmm. And uh, some of the other people working in the archives, uh, Turkish scholars. Were you were actually the first foreigner to be able to enter the Turkish archives. I was the first archives. foreigner admitted to work mm -hmm. in the archives. Yes. That was not because of any particular merit on my side. It was just because at that point they had reached a decision to admit foreigners. Mm -hmm. And I was the first foreigner. And you were there at that time. I was there and I applied. Mm -hmm. And to my utter astonishment and delight. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I was given permission to work in the archives. And then I spent a lot of time. You were saying that from the Ottoman archives you learned a lot of things. Oh, yes. Not only about the Ottoman history, but, but the histories of other nations who oh, were yes. under Ottoman rule during right. that time. I learned a great deal about all sorts of things. For example, remember at that time the Ottoman Empire ruled a large part of the Middle exactly. East yes. and a large part of Southeastern Europe. And um, it, it was very interesting to study the archives on places that I knew firsthand. Mm -hmm. I mean, for example, I was very interested at one time in the Ismailis. Ismailis are a sect of Islam. Oh, yes, Ismailis, of course. Yeah, the Ismailis are a sect. I was interested in them. I did my doctoral dissertation on the Ismailis. Mm -hmm. Now, there are some Ismaili villages in Syria. Oh, yes. In central Syria. You know where Hama is? Yes, Hama is a, is a town in Syria. Yeah, to the east and to the west of Hama, there are villages which are inhabited by Ismailis. Mm -hmm. And I went and spent some time there. My interest was not in Syria, rather, but in the Ismailis. But the Ismailis were in Syria, so I went to Syria. And I spent some time in these Syrian villages. They have a totally different outlook. And they have a very different religion. religious outlook, but mm -hmm. they speak the same Arabic as other people do. Yes, well. they do. Of so, spending a little while in that part of Syria uh, was a good preparation for when I went to the archives and started looking at the um, registers, mm -hmm. the Tapu Defterleri, for example, Tapu Defterleri, which yes. go village by village throughout the empire. Oh, yes. So, I was able to find my Syrian villages, which I knew at first hand. Mm -hmm in the Ottoman registers. Yes. Villages which which I knew from the twentieth century was able to find in the sixteenth century. Exactly. The same villages. It was a very exciting experience. And yes, Ottomans are, were very good taking records. The Ottomans were superb at taking keeping records. So just, you know. Very detailed, very meticulous mm -hmm. records of everything. And uh, this was enormously valuable information, and uh, I learned to read this stuff. And you are very patient, <laughs> well, reading through all that thing. A historian has to be patient. Mm -hmm. Yes. You can't be a, 
There's no such thing as an impatient historian. <laughs> and if you're an impatient historian, I suppose he was, you're waiting for it to happen. Yes. <laughs> so where was I? Oh, so that's what led me in that direction. And um, this, uh, this opportunity to work in the Turkish archives was really something quite unique. Now, the next point is, uh, at some stage, I don't remember exactly when, but it was not long after the war, the Royal Institute of International Affairs, do you know what that is? Not exactly. It's also known as Chatham House. Oh, Chatham House, yes, yeah. yes. Chatham House is the building where it lives, but it's mm -hmm. Royal Institute of International Affairs, well, the title tells you what it is. It's uh, exactly. an institute for international affairs, but uh, a, a more or less official one and central and so on. The Royal Institute of International Affairs decided that they wanted to publish a book on modern Turkey. Oh, so that's how it came out. Yes. So, what, they... What, what, what guided that decision? That I don't know. They were doing a number of books on various subjects. It wasn't the only one. The they making wanted, of modern Turkey was your They wanted to do book. the making of the modern world. Mm -hmm. And they, did, they chose what they thought were particularly important subjects. Mm -hmm. And one of the subjects that they chose was modern Turkey. So they, they decided the title was theirs, The Making of Modern Turkey. And uh, they looked around and they decided to ask me to do it. Oh. Now, I was not immediately attracted by the idea because I was more interested in Ottoman Turkey than in mm -hmm. modern Turkey. <laughs> On the other hand, it was very tempting because they said that I could go to Turkey as often as I wanted, stay as long as I like, and they would pay all the expenses. Fine. And uh, in those hard times, that was a considerable temptation. <laughs> I see so that. I agreed to do the book. Which year was that? It's after the war, I understand. Not 46, long after the war. 47. 47, well, no more than that. 48, 49, probably. 48, 49. Yeah, something like that. I'm not sure exactly. Mm -hmm. Anyway. Um, but the book was published in 1961, yes, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, I think so. It would have been in the 50s then. Okay. Yes, it would have been in the 50s. So um, I accepted this. Mm -hmm. And. Um, went to Turkey on a series of visits. Uh, the purpose for which I was sent and for which my journeys were paid for was to write this book. Mm -hmm. At the same time I took the opportunity to pursue my other interests. Now, this may amuse you. Um, when I went to Turkey on the first of my visits, the Royal Institute of International Affairs, which was sponsoring the book, mm -hmm. said when you go to Istanbul, you should uh, call on the British ambassador mm -hmm. and let him know why you're there and what you're doing and maybe he'll be able to help you. Mm -hmm. well, I was not accustomed to dealing with ambassadors, but if that's what they said, I thought they'd better do it. The British ambassador in Istanbul at that time was Sir James Bocock. I don't know if the name means anything to you. Well, it, it sort of rings a bell, no, but I mean, time just that. Mm -hmm. So James Bowker, yes. Bowker, B-O-W-K. Yeah. Yes, Bowker. So anyway, I uh, checked in at my hotel, and I uh, sent a message to the British Embassy asking if I could have an appointment with the ambassador. And uh, the ambassador, rather to my surprise, invited me to lunch. Oh, good. Now, there's a sort of hierarchy of these things. Inviting you to lunch is not as good as inviting you to dinner, but it's a lot better than inviting you to coffee. <laughs> if you see what I mean. Yes, the British are that way. <laughs> it's hierarchy. So um, I went to see the ambassador for lunch, and in accordance with British rules, we, uh, we talked about anything and everything except the business in hand <laughs> until the lunch was finished and the coffee was served. <coughs> and then His Excellency the British Ambassador turned to me and said, well, now you can tell me why are you here and what can I do for you? <laughs> so uh, I explained to him the purpose of my visit and that I had been asked by the Royal Institute of International Affairs to write a book on uh, the emergence of modern Turkey and so on and so on. And uh, he said, yes, he said, that's an interesting idea. He said, well, 
Uh, is there any way I can help you? Would you like me to set up some appointments for you with people in government and ministers and officials and so on? And I vividly remember this conversation. I said to him, well, I said, are you sure that would be wise? I said, I don't know how this book is going to turn out. When I finish it, they may like it. And they, may, they may dislike it. They may decide that it's insulting, in which case it would be embarrassing for you <laughs> to have introduced me. So he thought for a moment, and he said, that's a risk we have to take. Oh. You are a British scholar, I am your ambassador, it is my duty to help you. Okay. Well, as it turns out, that didn't happen. But it could have happened. Mm -hmm. Anyway. He, he didn't arrange any appointments, did he? He did, yes. He did. Okay. Yes, he who did. You, who did you see? It's a long time ago. And oh, I well, I, I one met, of the ministers? Or? I met various people in government, mm -hmm. yes. Oh, that's okay. No, I didn't get as high as ministers. No. Oh, yes, one minister I met. Um, Aras, David Grishta. David Grishta Aras, oh yes. yes. Yes, he's supposed to be a scholar himself. Yes, I met Tim Fingers, mm. and we had mm. some conversations. Yes, he used I to am. be the Minister of Foreign Affairs That's right. for some time. And then he was ambassador in London for a while. Yes, exactly. I met him, and one or two others, but uh, you know, it's a long time ago. Okay. And when you get to my age, you have difficulty in remembering names. Mm. <clears throat> But you it even has a name for getting names. You know, it's called Anomia. Oh, you're very good with them. <laughs> you're very anyway, good let me continue. So I saw various people and um, I went there a number of times and uh, I read a number of documents, mm. what was permitted. I read a lot of newspapers, 19th century newspapers and early 20th <laughs> century newspapers. And eventually I produced this book. Well, was 500 odd pages, as Something far as like I remember. That yes. is. <clears throat> now, we had no idea what the Turkish reaction would be to this book. Oh, it's, it's uh, it might have been positive, it might have been negative. It is very positive. I mean, I know it was very positive, but there were some negative things in the book. Oh yes, definitely, it has to be. I mean, you know, I was trying to tell the truth. I had a section on the Varlik Verifici, for example. Which one? Oh, Varlik Oh yes. Which is not a good thing. Oh, chapter. yes, definitely not. And then, anyway, it was welcomed in Turkey, it was accepted, it was celebrated even. Mm -hmm. And um, <clears throat> from that point onwards, I was sort of persona grata. Persona grata, yes, of course. Not non grata. It, it, it is very interesting that, I mean, in all your articles, you have always been in favor of Turkey and the Turkish people. Sometimes, I mean, we see you criticizing the Arabs, the Iranians, etc. But your approach to Turkey and the Turkish people has always been positive. For example, in 1953, on the 500th year of the conquest of Istanbul, there had been a lot of, you know, um, work, a lot of articles published in, mm -hmm. in the Western world saying that the, this, the greatest stronghold of Christianity has been invaded mm. by barbarians and things like that. And there's one article that you wrote which was completely different. And what was the name of that article? Um, Europe and the Turks, the yeah. civilization of the Ottoman Empire. Yeah. It was published in History Today, October mm -hmm. 1953. Yeah. And it was, you know... I would not describe myself as pro-Turkish or pro-anyone else. I'm pro-truth. Yes. You are a historian. Uh, exactly. I'm a historian by profession. And my duty is to tell the truth as I see it. Where the truth is unpleasant, one has to face that. Mm -hmm. But um, unfortunately, the, the image of the Turks in Europe, for understandable reasons, mm -hmm. was subject to almost systematic defamation over oh, centuries. Yes. I mean, it's understandable because Turkey was the enemy. Turkey was, was the most dangerous enemy. Turkey was the great threat to European civilization, to, to Christendom and so on. Mm. So naturally they tended to see Turkey and the Turks <laughs> in and a negative light. The, yes, and of course there were the natural enemies of Turkey, the, the exactly. Armenians, the Greeks, the Bulgarians. Yeah, well they didn't become important until much later. Mm -hmm. 
But then for a long time, the main reason, as I said, was that uh, this was the great threat. I mean, even uh, in England, England was a long way from, uh, from any Turkish armies, but the Corsairs from North Africa were raiding the coasts of England mm -hmm. and Ireland and capturing people in the English uh, uh, seashore and taking them off. But they weren't Turks. What? They weren't Turks. They weren't Turks, but they were called Turks. <laughs> because, they were the, because they were Muslims. I mean, <laughs> Turk came to mean Muslim. Yes, exactly. Um, just as in earlier times, Muslims were called Moors, mm -hmm. when the main battlefield was Spain, and the Muslims came out of Morocco into Spain, so the Muslims were called Moors. You see, it's interesting that although Christendom, Christianity and Islam were the two main religions. Mm -hmm. The two, oh, the only two religions, as far as I know, which you can call world religions. Mm -hmm. All the others are local or regional or tribal. You can say Judeo-Christianity on one side and then yes, Islam, or Judeo -Islam on the other. <laughs> but the Jews are not a separate civilization. No, of course. The Jews are a, a subcomponent in two civilizations, the Muslim and the Christian. Oh yes, definitely. Yeah, but uh, the only two religions which claim and for a while exercised global outreach are Christianity and Islam. And here each of them saw themselves as the fortunate recipients of God's final message to humanity. <laughs> <laughs> and naturally, as the as I said, as the fortunate recipients of God's final message to humanity, it was their duty not to keep it selfishly to themselves, like the Jews or the Buddhists, but to bring it to the rest of the world, removing whatever obstacles there might be in the way. <laughs> so, when you have two religions side by side, with the same self-perception, the same sense of mission, and adjoining each other like that, conflict was inevitable. Obviously. And what I think is very interesting is the refusal on both sides to recognize the other as a religion. <laughs> if you look at the European literature, they don't talk about Muslims. They don't even talk about Mohammedans until comparatively modern times. Mm. In the Middle Ages, they call them Moors, and in more recent times, they call them Turks or Tatars. Saracens. Or well, Saracens. Saracens, yes, earlier. In mm -hmm. earlier times, Saracens, and then, Moors. then Moors, yes. you're right. First Saracens, then Moors, mm -hmm. then Turks and Tatars. Yes. But not Muslims. And on the Muslim side, it's the same. They refer to them as Franks. Mm -hmm. And they were not French at all. <laughs> on the they they of them refer to them as Rome or Rome. as French. Yes. They were not Romans and they were not Franks. Mm -hmm. But they did not want to use a religious designation for the other. It's exactly the same on both sides. Yes. <laughs> um, and that, I think, is interesting. It was, really. Um, no, I mean, Christendom and Islam were brought into conflict, not by their differences, but by their resemblances. Um, you see, the, the Jewish Talmud yes. says quite explicitly, the righteous of all peoples have a place in paradise. Mm -hmm. Now, this is explicitly not the Christian or the Muslim view. No. For Christians and for Muslims, paradise is their exclusive preserve. Obviously. Only yes. they will go there and everyone else will go to hell. Yes, especially so, <coughs> Dante. Yeah. And so that when they met. Comedia. When they met and argued, they could understand each other. I mean, even at the height of the Middle Ages, a Christian and a Muslim could argue and understand each other. I mean, if a Christian said to a Muslim, or a Muslim said to a Christian, you are an infidel and you will burn in hell, <laughs> each understood exactly what the other meant, because they meant the same thing. I mean, that would have been meaningless the two to a Chinese or an Indian. Yes. <laughs> the two religions were not so essentially different from each other. No, they were very as similar. As an Indian or a Chinese yeah. religion would be. They were very similar, and as I say, it was their similarities more than their differences that brought them into conflict. <laughs> Yes. Which is not unusual, by the way. <laughs> well, sir, what, what is your impression of the present time Turkey? 
Mm. What, what, what do you think of it? I mean, I'd like to. Is this on the record or off the record? It's it's on the record. It's it's yeah. been recorded. And I watch with concern. I have been watching Turkey for a long time. Yes, sir. And I've seen many different faces. There were some which I found particularly moving. Mm -hmm. I was in Turkey in 1950 mm -hmm. when something unprecedented in Islamic history and rarely followed. The government held a general election and lost it mm -hmm. and withdrew and gave way to the opposition. I mean, this is democracy in the fullest and truest sense of the word. Mm -hmm. This happened in Turkey in 1950. I was there at the time and it was a deeply moving experience to see this. Nothing like that had ever happened before and nothing like that has ever happened else in most of the rest of the Islamic world. Mm -hmm. Since then, Turkish democracy has gone through a number of vicissitudes. Mm -hmm. And um, to be honest, I don't know where it stands at the present yes. moment. I would like to receive, sir, your frank impression, because I mean, there's a lot of concern at the time that the present government is sort of pushing Turkey towards Islamic yes. and Islamic um, government type rather than the. <coughs> the, the Look, Turkey is, a, Turkey is a predominantly Muslim country. The overwhelming majority of Turks are, to some extent, Muslim. Mm. And uh, I, think, I think it's perfectly natural that they should want to express that in their public life. But there's a difference between being a Muslim and creating an Islamic state. Exactly. I mean, the Turks are perfectly entitled to be good Muslims. Obviously, yes. But being a good Muslim doesn't mean to say you have to impose a clerical fascism. That's not an Islamic invention, that's an adaptation of European customs. Are you under the impression, looking from the outside, that Turkey is sort of being driven in that direction? Um, driven is too strong a word. Mm -hmm. But I think there are tendencies in that direction, mm -hmm. yes. In the present government? Yeah. Well, not only in the present government, in the present country. I mean, there are changes in mood in Turkey. Obviously, yes. Uh, we, we have a very strong figure as prime minister at the moment. Yes. And so he's, you know, very influential and he gathers a lot of votes. But, of course, we don't know what his real intentions are and so that's yeah. the important thing. Anyway, so we... we no, I mean, the separation of church and state is, of course, a Christian idea. Obviously, I mean, it goes back French to the, to begin with. It goes back to the beginnings of Christianity, right? Uh, when Christ makes a distinction between God and Caesar, mm -hmm. and the great difference is this: Christianity was a persecuted minority religion for three hundred years before the uh, the Emperor Constantine was converted to Christianity, mm -hmm. and that began the two processes of the Christianization of Rome and the Romanization of Christ. Obviously. <laughs> With Islam is different. That's an interesting I mean, observation. The, the Prophet Muhammad was not persecuted or crucified. He triumphed during his lifetime. Not he, but his enemies were put to death. And he established a state yes, which did. became an empire, a state of which he was the ruler. So that in yes. Islam, in contrast to Christianity, in Islam you have from the very beginning a, a total identification mm -hmm. of religion and government which has no parallel in the Christian world. Exactly. I mean, the, the usual Christian dilemma of church and state is meaningless in Islam. In Islam yes. Now, what the Turks did over centuries was to develop, I won't say a separation, but a distinction between religion and government. I mean, they created the, uh, the office of the chief mufti, uh, the Bash Mefturuk. Yes. Um, this is a new institution. It's not part of classical Islam. It's an Ottoman development. And it is the equivalent of an ecclesiastical hierarchy. Mm -hmm. And um, mm -hmm. with that came the idea of secularism. Yes. I mean, Secularism is a totally alien idea. There is no word for it. You know. and we can go further than that. You have a whole series of pairs of words 
in all the languages of Christendom, um, religious and secular, uh, religious and profane, uh, secular and ecclesiastical, mm -hmm. um, and so on and so on. They don't exist in the Islamic world because no, they, they they express a dichotomy, which has no. Does not in exist Islam. in Islam. Yes. I mean. The church and state are one and the same. Obviously, yes. It wasn't until Ottoman times. Also, and the Quran. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. It wasn't until Ottoman times that the Ottomans began to develop a church, mm -hmm. the Bashmif Tuluk. Bashmif Tuluk. Um, which is the equivalent of a church. And uh, that made it possible for the secularists in Turkey to separate them. You can't separate unless you have two things. Of course, you one. must have two things to be able to <laughs> yeah. separate them. Exactly. If you have only one thing... But previously, I mean, this, this very notion of separation of church and state would have been meaningless in Islamic terms. Mm -hmm. It isn't now. Obviously, yes, sir. And if you look, for example, at Iran... Yes. Well, there's always this concern in Turkish people that they would think that one day under the present government that Turkey would come to look like Iran. Uh, do you think that it is possible? Oh, I don't think it's likely to go that far. Mm -hmm. I don't think it will. I don't think it's likely to go that far, but uh, it seems to be moving in that direction. It say. seems to be moving in that direction. But there's still a long way to go before it becomes like Iran. <laughs> mm -hmm. I see, sir. Okay, uh, we, we don't want to tire you too much, and I don't know how much time we have left there. But uh, we have one uh, final question to ask you about this Armenian question that you were always pro-Turkish in all your... Um, I wasn't being pro-Turkish, I was being pro-history. Pro-history. Yes, the, 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 the scholars in Turkey say that Professor Lewis knows Turkish history, Ottoman history, very well. And he should know very well what happened in 1915 and before the exile and after the exile and what was the cause of that, etc. It was not a genocide and he should know quite well that it was not. That was their opinion. So what is your opinion, sir? What do you think now, about the, that? What, the issue is this. Um, what I was objecting to was not describing the Armenian massacres as massacres. I was objecting to a line of, which was being developed at that time, comparing it with the Nazi destruction of the Jews. Huh. And it seemed, to me, it seemed to me that that was an absurdity. Okay, sir. Thank you. Because the Nazi destruction of the Jews, first of all, it covered everybody. Mm -hmm. Second, it was based entirely on their identity and not anything that they were doing. The Armenians were engaged in what we nowadays call a war of national liberation. Oh, yes. I mean, they were fighting... They have a right to do that. They were fighting for an independent Armenia yes. in the East and also in, uh, in Cilician Armenia. Now, that's all right. They're entitled to do that. They were also doing this in alliance with the Russians and the British, two countries with which Turkey was at war at that time. Yes. Now, um, I don't dispute that the Armenians had a right to pursue a national liberation struggle. But I don't think one can reasonably compare this with what happened to the Jews in Germany and in German-occupied Europe. Oh, yes. I mean, to say that this is a genocide, in that sense, seemed to me then and seems to me now to be an absurdity. I mean, it was a ferocious struggle, and there's no doubt at all that great numbers of Armenians perished. The best estimate is a million and a half. That That's seems, what they say. That seems to be the generally agreed figure. A million and a half. But as I say, the important the, the, there is a question whether there was a deliberate massacre as distinct from people being killed mm -hmm. in the course of a an armed struggle. It's not the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, there was certainly an order of deportation. Oh, yeah. No doubt about that. They were deported. But you see, when the Armenians were deported from Cilicia, and they went to Iraq and Palestine. Mm -hmm. They were received and welcomed by the Armenian communities in those places who helped them, found homes for them and so on, which were also under Ottoman rule. 
-hmm. Now when the Jews were expelled from Germany and they went to Poland, they were not received and welcomed by the Polish Jews, yes, who were that. sharing the same fate. Yes, I, I mean, the comparison is absurd. Mm -hmm. And the main difference is that the, the Jews of Germany were not engaged in any kind of rebellion or struggle. On the contrary, they were loyal German yes, citizens. Yes, peaceful people. They were loyal German citizens and... Uh, Involved in trade. And, 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 yes, and, and everything else. And they, they were attacked purely because of their Jewishness. So that um, it seemed to me that to compare the two was an absurdity. Well, not just to compare them, but to equate them. Mm -hmm. I mean, they talked about the two genocides, the Jews in Germany and the yes, Armenians. In Germany. Tried to draw a parallel yes. between them. Or well, more than a parallel, people were saying that they're the same sort of thing. <laughs> um, what I was trying to do was not to diminish the sufferings of the Armenians or the losses that they suffered, but oh, yes. to try and put it in historical context. There's and you know, the Armenians also massacred Turks occasionally. That was true too, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so. Uh, one final thing, sir. I don't want to tire you too much. That's all right. I'm that fine. Uh, you are a Western historian. You had a Western education. I'm a Western, Western historian in, in the sense that I'm a product of the West. Yes. You are a product. I'm not a histo West. Western historian, uh, in that I don't write the history of the West. That was uh, yes. That was the wrong word. Yes. I, I, no, it's but right, but I think we have to be clear what we mean. Between the people, between the historians who were raised in the West. Yeah. You are the only one who can really understand the East, the Middle East, Middle Eastern questions, Middle Eastern people. Not just the Turks, but the Arabs, the Israelis, the mm, Palestinians. So. In all your books, you have this uh, very wise um, understanding of the matters that are important there. How they look at the world, what are their views, what are their... Well, the business, it is the duty of the historian to try and understand the people whose history he is studying. You are impartial. That's the important thing. Well, most, of these, most of these people were not impartial as you were. No, I think one has to be. Um, you know, we, we learn from history. I mean, history is the collective memory of our society. Obviously, yes. Um, and a society which has no memory is suffering from amnesia and a society which has distorted memory is suffering from neurosis. <laughs> That's very good, sir. Thank you very much. So just as a final thing, would you have a few words to say, if you like, in Turkish, if not in English? A message to the Turkish Academy of Sciences, to Turkey in general. I thank you very profoundly for conferring upon me the honor of electing me as a member of your society. This is one which gave me great happiness and uh, I, I was then and I remain in fact become increasingly grateful to you no. for this. It is both a pleasure and a privilege and I thank you for taking the trouble to come and talk to me on this occasion. So, sir, thank you very much. This was very interesting and very enlightening for us too. And it's a good message that I would carry back to the... Well, thank you. That's very kind of you. And I very much appreciate your taking the trouble to come all this way just in order to talk to an old man like me. You're not an old man. You're a wise man. Thank you very well, much for being with us. <laughs>